The WTO claims to be a forum for trade negotiation. A new global constitution. A process whereby the consensus of the Quad is imposed upon the majority. The is an organization that does not serve the interests of But people. this isn't really about trade between countries. Hi, I'm Walden Bellio and uh, I've been working on the World Trade Organization for some time now along with many other people and um, I'm here to tell you why the World Trade Organization is bad for you. But first, what is the WTO? What is the WTO? Um, the WTO is the World Trade Organization. The WTO essentially was set up to coordinate the economic activities of the rich countries along with the multinational corporations. The WTO is literally based in Geneva. The WTO covers a whole range of areas and I think this is one of the important things about it is it's an extremely big organization. An organization that comes with uh, more than 140 countries. The World Trade Organization was only created recently in 1995 to enforce a whole number of treaties. The main one being a thing called GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, are now one of 23 different agreements that the WTO enforces. The WTO claims to be a forum for trade negotiations, but in fact it is being turned into an instrument to control all countries throughout the world, not only through trade, but through trade-related agreements. And each of our governments have people there theoretically representing us, but actually not really. And we the people, trade unions, peasant organizations, just average people, we have no seat at the table. Uh, the WTO is an international uh, institution which has been put together by the imperialists to actually impose trade rules on the world. It's only the interests of big corporations and banks that are represented. And what they are saying is that money values should rule over life values, that human rights and the environment should be subordinated to the needs of commerce. And that's just wrong. So the big secret about the WTO is some people call it a trade agreement, but that just isn't accurate because the binding provision of the WTO requires all countries shall conform their domestic laws, regulations, and administrative procedures to the WTO agreements. The WTO is kind of like a noose <laughs> around the neck of human rights, of environmental stewardship, of people's right to health care and to safe jobs and housing and education. What the WTO does essentially is the WTO places rules on governments which mean that they can no longer regulate corporations. WTO is the place where company can use to escape the law of each country including their own countries. So what that means practically is that this isn't really about trade between countries, but it's about handcuffs on what policies our governments can put in place at home on a huge array of issues from who controls basic services like water and electricity. Well, I think it's really important that people not only look at the World Trade Organization as a trade regime, but I think it's really important we understand it as a, as a new global constitution. This is the final level of constitutional development. And all of these is a one-size-fits-all set of rules at the WTO that all the countries are supposed to meet. And the problem is, of course, is that the WTO has enforcement mechanisms. It can force governments to abide by that global economic constitution. And the WTO has rules that suck. So when governments go back on or try and change the rules of the WTO, they can be faced with escalating economic sanctions. So in other words, there is a whole system of economic punishment built into it. The WTO's concern is only one way. It's only to privatize, to deregulate, to let the corporations come in. And citizens have basically become the enemy of the WTO because we're standing in the way. Well, it's a trade organization, but it's not a fair trade organization. So, uh, well, I don't know how much I will say about it. That's WTO. What is democracy? Well, democracy, as we know, is individuals, you know, choose their rulers and that the majority are the ones that are the decision makers. Given this criterion, the WTO is one of the most undemocratic organizations around. Uh, although it is supposed to be a multilateral organization that runs on one country, one vote, 
In fact, the last time a vote was taken in the GATT WTO was in 1959. Now what you have is a process called consensus. And this is really a process whereby the consensus of the Quad, which is Canada, Japan, the United States, and the EU, is imposed on the majority. The WTO to me is like a place where traders come and negotiate their trade. It cannot be a democratic forum because major traders certainly have more power than the, the smaller traders. It's an illegitimate forum. It says World Trade Organization. It's true that it incorporates it with very large membership, but at the same time it is not world represented there in the sense that the voice of the few prevails and it calls itself organization. Organization means some system whereby we resolve things in a rational way. It doesn't happen in that way. It functions more as a mafiosi. So it's neither world nor trade nor organization. But still it calls itself world trade organization. In the WTO the decisions are not made in formal plenaries like you find in democracies. What you have in the WTO, especially in the ministerials, is that the plenaries are reserved for speech making and the actual decision making is reserved to what is called a green room process in which just a few countries, about 20 or 25, take the decisions. This so-called green rooms, nobody knows who is chosen, how they are chosen, at least in formal terms. But everybody knows that they're there because the EU and the United States thinks that this set of countries is needed to be able to legitimize what the EU and the United States think is the agenda. Even though the WTO tends to claim that uh, it is a democratic organization, but it really represents the developed countries' positions rather than developing countries' positions. For instance, in the Sheraton Convention Center in Doha, the real locus of decision-making was not in the formal planners. It was taking place elsewhere in the hotel, where representatives of the big powers with a few other countries were the ones determining the agenda. But the WTO doesn't just benefit companies. What we see is the companies are actually writing the rules of the WTO themselves. And it's really amazing that we come into the 21st century with one of the most important international organizations around, not even being democratic but very feudal in its decision making. This cannot be allowed to continue. What is food security? It is the ability of a country to be able to feed itself. Overall, food security is a very comprehensive concept that means that people have the right to food and have the right to produce food. Countries have the right to be able to have an agricultural system that responds to their interests. Food security now is something that is being lost. The WTO has something called the Agreement on Agriculture. It institutionalizes inequality. It institutionalizes high, tremendous subsidies for farming interests in the European Union and the United States. Through the Agreement on Agriculture, corporations are able to dump subsidized food on third world countries robbing farmers of their livelihoods. Meantime, they are able to take over domestic markets in food production and deny us our right to our food culture, our right to livelihoods in food, and our right to safe food. Also, um, it's very interesting because whenever subsidies are provided for the rich corporations, it is classified as incentives, and incentives are said to be good. When the state supports the poor, in the poor countries, then that's called subsidies, and subsidies are said to be bad. The, the main issue is that the WTO is killing local farmers because they are directly competing with what local farmers are producing. In many countries in the north, about 30 to 50 percent of farmers' incomes are provided by state subsidies. Now compare that to the developing countries. The Agri Agreement on Agriculture demands a liberalization, the lifting of tariffs, the end of quotas, and market access 
into these countries, whereas agriculture in these countries is not subsidized. Uh, there's very little subsidization of agriculture because these countries do not have the money to subsidize their farmers. For example, in Thailand, as an agricultural country, we can see that the market access of the WTO, the opening up of the market, agriculture market in Thailand, has a negative impact. After the AOA, the, the government have to open up this market, reduce the taxation, and the cheap agricultural product from northern countries, for example, from the U.S. and E.U. that has been dumped into, into Thailand has flooded the, the local market. So the small-scale producer can't do anything. They, they, they can't fight with this so cheap agriculture product. So what happens, therefore, is that subsidized crops, which can be easily disposed by lowering their prices, are dumped on our countries. And the cost of producing goods by our farmers who are not subsidized is quite high so that inevitably the grain from the north, the beef from the north, the chicken part supplies from the north, when they come into our countries they can be sold at a price cheaper than the cost of production uh, of our farmers. So what happens therefore is that because of unequal competition our farmers are put out of business. That is what the AOA is all about. It is not an agreement to promote free trade. It is in fact an agreement to consolidate and hold on to monopoly. When it comes to the question of services, which is GATS, the General Agreement on Trade in Services, I think the problem that we face here is a situation whereby there is really a great threat that public services, uh, including health, education, water, are going to be opened up to transnational corporations. GATS, which is an agreement, would be a process of legalizing in many countries, a process of privatization of essential public services. The WTO basically says you can't have regulations to protect your health, your water, your natural resources, your people, if those regulations are interrupt the flow of, of international trade. So it's trade is the only important thing. For instance, on water, any country that wants to protect its water and say that it's a fundamental human right is going to run straight into the World Trade Organization. Water is a human need, not a human right, and that's what the WTO says. That's not a semantic thing. If water is a human need, then anybody can deliver this water, the, the private sector, anybody. But if it's a human right, you can't market or trade or sell a human right. Nobody should be allowed to make money from somebody's need for water. So the, the problem with neoliberalism that many people identify is that uh, it encourages the commodification of everything. And when we get to water and we're buying water uh, that should be purified uh, and, and made available for us as citizens of our municipalities, when we see French and British water companies, especially German and U.S. coming in now, taking the water and adding a 30% or more profit uh, and then taking that money uh, out of the countries where poor people are suffering, have little capital. We've got a big, big problem. In South Africa, there is a tragedy going on. We had a hope that once we overthrew apartheid, we'd have water for all, electricity for all, houses for all, education for all. But now, because of privatization, many poor people are losing access to electricity, to water, to their houses. The government is busy selling off government uh, assets such as our telecommunications, our roads, our water, which means that these services are going to be provided to make a profit and not to provide a service. The case in point is actually the uh, privatization and the commodification of water. Now it's clear that the uh, European Union uh, is representing the interests of two big water, corpor water corporations, uh, VBND Environment and also uh, Swiss Lyonnais, both are French companies. Uh, and they're working together with, uh, or it appears that they're working together with the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, pushing for full cost recovery, uh, pushing for no subsidies for uh, water resources, especially for the poor and poor farmers. Uh, and especially saying that if you want to acquire water, then you have to pay for it. As soon as these services are in the hands of uh, the multinational corporations, it means that we won't have democratic control 
over such services. Any uh, country that wants to protect its water, that says water is a human right and that we want to keep it in the public hands, in the public domain, it's not going to be allowed to do it anymore. Because under the WTO, water is a good, which means that you can't restrict its, its export even if it's for environmental reasons. Water is a service now, and that means you have to open up your service, your, your municipal services to big corporations, and soon they're going to be putting water as an investment in the World Trade Organization, which means corporations will be able to sue governments of other countries if they interrupt their corporate rights or their right to profit in that country. It will force many governments to deregulate, which means that uh, we move to a market model for the distribution of services rather than uh, making sure that all people uh, who have a right to those services are are in fact going to receive them. The introduction of prepaid cards is the best expression of the um, full cost uh, recovery, uh, full cost pricing though. Now what this means is that if you, have, if you want to have access to water, you need to have money because you need the money in order to buy the, the prepaid cards for water. However, if you are unable to secure the funds to buy the, water, buy the cards, then you really have no money to have access to water though. And uh, if you have no water, then you die. The very basic spiritual and life-giving elements of water that we've as human beings relied on for all of our uh, recorded history um, now come under threat. We've, we've needed purified and cleansed water. We've had that for a couple of centuries in many countries and, and in the third world uh, in the last few decades and obviously uh, only, only half the, the third world is actually getting access to the clean uh, drinking water. But what we, what we would desperately want to see happen uh, now is to assure that everyone has at least that basic uh, free lifeline, everyone in the world. And so it's really the job of citizens who care about the very most elemental uh, component of our lives. We need water to live. We mustn't let private companies take it away. And we must stop these so-called multilateral agencies, which really act for these big companies. This is where we really will draw the line. We desperately need the water for drinking, for, for life. The WTO includes all kinds of new special corporate protections. And one of those is about what is called intellectual property. The right to own, to have a monopoly control of through a patent of an idea or a product. And one of the most serious of these in Africa is the so-called trade-related intellectual property rights. What it does, the trade-related intellectual property rights, by having such tight patent laws uh, and copyright laws, uh, is that it restricts technological innovation. Now that the United States, Britain, the European countries have become developed, one must realize that uh, when they were in their period of industrialization, these countries and Japan engaged in industrialization by imitation, basically by taking on the innovations of others without paying much for it or paying at all. Now, with the trips coming in, the autonomy of having such patent laws has been severely restricted. The patent life has been extended to 20 years and all processes and products become patentable. There is hardly an area where you find that the patent law could not be claimed and therefore you have a very ridiculous situation where you find that the traditional things in India like basmati rice is being now patented by some firm in America. So for instance, a subsistence farmer, a small farmer in a village whose great 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 grandfather and mother have come up with the perfect seed and this seed over years of trying is the perfect seed for the climate and for all the surroundings and this super seed is shared and saved year after year and replanted to feed people in the community. If for instance a Swiss or other company comes in, a seed company, a US company and takes the seed and gets the patent on it then the farmers in the village whose ancestors created the seed are forbidden from replanting their own seed from their own garden, from their own crop, without paying a fee, a license fee, to the owner of this new property. So you find that the things which are in public domain are being brought in private domain for private profit. The patent law is being amended in order to make it a monopolist instrument in the hands of private operators. The reality of this is countries are told to come pull up the crops and starve people or make the poor farmer pay 
the money they don't have simply to plant their own seed. Similarly, health service has become a business proposition with the result that the public facility of health provided by government at no or low cost gets restricted and you have a situation where health care is possible, available only for those who can afford to pay. The TRIPS agreement in the WTO have become a monstrous barrier to the capacity of states and societies inflicted with the epidemic of HIV AIDS to provide low cost medicine for HIV and AIDS uh, victim survivors. It puts a control over the use, trade, purchase of medicinal drugs that are needed. And in African countries, there are something like 30 million people who are affected with HIV AIDS. And African governments would like to be able to buy these drugs from countries such as India and Brazil, which produce them much more cheaply. But the pharmaceutical companies using their governments have threatened to take African countries such as South Africa to the World Trade Organization Dispute Court and charge them with violating the intellectual property rights of these pharmaceuticals. So they are preventing African countries from buying life-saving drugs much more cheaply and that is extremely serious. On the drug issues, because in Thailand we have the severe case of uh, AIDS uh, epidemics and as in all the countries as well, as in uh, South Africa, in Latin America, in India, uh, a patient in Thailand can't access to cheap drugs and they have to die because there is drug that can help them to prolong their life but they can't really access to that because of the uh, trip uh, regulation that prohibit uh, the Thailand to produce or, or to import generic drugs. Uh, as you know right now is we have a medicine to treat people with AIDS but we cannot afford because it's a, uh, a, a patent by uh, that company pressure uh, uh, or involving with uh, World Trade Organization and come up for a trip that is uh, uh, that is make situation uh, age of enemy is worse. Um, we lost many friends uh, because we cannot afford uh, drug. Trips is work like a try to protect a transnational cooperation or a cooperation that uh, claim to do the research and to develop a new kind of drugs. But uh, as a result, uh, poor people can access to these uh, expensive drugs and government in those countries, also in Thailand, don't have the budget to purchase this drug. But actually, uh, this is not accurate, uh, uh, how can I say, story because this uh, company can really uh, benefit from the, the sale of all the drug, even though they reduce the price because the return from the research has been already received uh, by selling drugs uh, in northern countries. So this whole process of commodification of uh, services uh, has been encouraged by the WTO, which is not in the interest of people. So I think that given the experience of the last seven years, I think that there is a sense that the WTO is an organization that does not serve the interests of people, that uh, it is an, an agency that mainly serves the interests of the transnational corporations, and that it is a very anti-development sort of organization. The next uh, WTO ministerial, which is taking place in Cancun, in Mexico, is a watershed for the peoples of the world to stop this process and to prevent a new round being established. As far as what's at stake in Cancun, it's a very, very important moment. Literally at Cancun, there will be decision either to expand WTO through adding four new issues. Investment and trade facilitation, procurement of government. Also an agreement on competition policy. Uh, these new agreements, if they come into being, would be very damaging to the interests of the developing countries. We have to say that those issues are not issues for traders to decide. And government saying no will stop that. That is what we all have to work for. 
The WTO in its current form has to go. The WTO is a disaster. It's a, an institution that promotes corporations, tells governments that they can't protect their citizens or their environment anymore, and people have to say no to the WTO. This is not an organization that can be reformed or improved because it is based and it functions on a fundamentally dangerous paradigm or model, which is a danger to the whole world. And therefore, I think what we need to do is, A, to bring pressure on our own national governments so that they behave and they protect our interests, and B, bring pressure and make the international organizations and their bureaucracy aware of the tremendous mass discontent that is welling up in all the developing countries. Do we need international trade rules? Of course we do. Nobody's against trade and nobody's against fair trade. But it's insane to be sending food halfway around the world that should be grown locally when people locally are going hungry. It's insane to let big corporations come in and take over your water when people need that water for life. It's insane to turn around and say you can't have your own local public health care systems. You got to let big American corporations in to give health care but only to those who can afford it. This is no way to run the world. This will destroy the world. So this is a political showdown. In Seattle the people were winning. In Doha the bad guys won a little, and in Cancun will be the real decision. And so it's very important for the long term that there's victory. I hope that the people in the world, especially our governments, will wake up to the fact that a very important decision will be made in Cancun. And if we make the wrong decision, it will damage the income and livelihood of uh, many hundreds of millions of people. Esperamos encontrarnos en Cancún miles y miles de ciudadanos de todas partes del mundo y asentarle un duro golpe a la OMC e impedir nuevas rondas de negociaciones. And we have to say no to WTO and the corporations that WTO is putting in place in our lives. It's not our trade agreement. It belongs to the corporations. They can have it, but you know what? They can't do anything with it because we say no. It is very important that mass movements, political parties, uh, people all over the world unite and bring their efforts together to focus on the most immediate task to derail the ministerial in Cancun of the World Trade Organization. Now that you know how bad the WTO is for you, shouldn't you do something about it? Join us in derailing the WTO ministerial in Cancun, Mexico in September 2003. We'll see you there.